Welcome to Auto Chatter. Today's discussion will be about Chrysler's minivans. These were not the first smaller vans ever made, but are often credited at being the first to produce a new class of vehicle in the U.S. that basically took over the previous wagon market. As always, facts, opinion, and speculation will be given. Please give a like if you enjoyed it, and consider subscribing if you haven't yet. Now let's see some Chrysler van history. The minivan today is a common sight on the streets, but that wasn't always the case. Chrysler wasn't even the first to consider this concept, not by a long shot. The Stout Motor Company had a vehicle called a Scarab in the 1930s. It was certainly ahead of its time and expensive as they were hand-built and would set you back over $100,000 in today's money. Only about 10 were made, including a prototype. It was uh, more designed as a spacious car versus something you filled with kids and sippy cups. But by the early 50s, the Germans had a few vehicles one could call early minivans, with the DKW Shellaster coming first. You could say this was an Audi in a way, as Auto Union eventually morphed into it. This vehicle was front-wheel drive with a transverse mounted engine, flat floor, and the rear seats were con configurable. All things every minivan now has for the most part. Now these vehicles were never sold in the US, but another one that some may claim is the first mainstream minivan in the US was. That would be the VW Microbus. Based off a modified VW Bug platform, these smaller vans had a very successful life that I already discussed in their own episode. Later in the 1950s, Fiat offered a tiny 600 Multipla MPV or multi-purpose vehicle that was a common taxi in Italy. There was also other small van things in Europe and Asia popping up, but their size might have had more to do with the environment and markets they were designed for as narrow streets and other factors dictated as such. Domestic automakers by the 60s were creating some vans that were smaller than what they would become later. Chevy debuted the Greenbrier in the early 60s as a response to the VW Microbus, and it was based off a Corvair that was also rear-engined and air-cooled like VW's then. Ford and Dodge had smallish passenger vans in the 60s too, but they had water-cooled front-mounted engines. All of these domestic vans eventually morphed into larger ones closer to size of a full-size truck, and enjoyed a van trend of their own for a while, peaking in the 1970s. These 60s domestic vans are what the mystery machine from Scooby-Doo were based off of. Now by the early 70s, Ford had the chance to beat the other domestics to market with a minivan. Lee Iacocca was made the president of Ford when the decade started, and one project he felt would be hot was a less truck-like and easier to manage van for families that would be even more practical and roomier than a wagon which was the popular go-to for uh, families then. It would also be garageable, which was important as your full-size van probably wasn't fitting in there. By 1972, a concept version was shown called the Carousel. Lee Iacocca felt this market segment could be huge and tentative plans were in place for these to be launched by or around 1975. Unfortunately, the 73 old crisis prompted Ford to cut back on new vehicle development Another issue was like Xerox in the 70s, then invented the concept and working prototype of a personal computer, complete with a mouse and graphical user interface, but felt launching it would threaten their own existing copier business, and abandoned the market for others to make money off of. Some Ford execs saw the carousel minivan as a threat to their then profitable and popular wagon market. In hindsight, they would be correct but took the let's take the short-term profit route and pumped out more wagons. Iacocca's carousel project unfortunately was DOA. By 1977, Chrysler was kicking around a similar rear-wheel drive setup to what the doomed Ford carousel would have been, and by 1978, Lee Iacocca was fired from Ford and assumed the leadership role at Chrysler. The company was in sad shape and losing money, but Iacocca had ideas. He noticed the current lineup was on platforms that were where nothing was interchangeable from one to the other, raising production costs. 
a platform that was modular in design to allow different vehicle types, but under the skin shared key components, could help turn Chrysler around. This kicked off development of the K platform that in itself was modeled after the Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon front-wheel drive L cars that came out for the 78 model year. Chrysler's future minivan project would now also be a front-wheel drive design too. Now all of this development would be expensive and Chrysler was in no state to start writing checks for it then. In 1979, Mr. Iacocca appealed to Congress to approve government-backed loans, giving them the cash flow he needed to get the company back on track. The first K-car vehicles launched for the 81 model year to much success and helped push Chrysler from the brink of bankruptcy to a profitable company in a very short period of time. But there was another offshoot of their new platform and design philosophy that was to be a big deal for Chrysler in the 1980s as well. GM could have stolen their minivan Thunder four years earlier as a Chevy Nomad 2 concept was being developed. It was front-wheel drive and based off their X cars like the Chevy Citation. Looking at it, it's wild to think that GM probably got closer to minivan perfection then than what we actually got from them later. The Astro was too truck-like and the Dustbuster vans too weird. What followed later with vehicles like the Venture and Uplander was just checking boxes on what a minivan should have, and they ultimately, they failed. I'm not sure why GM killed the Nomad 2, but it could have been a contender. Anyway, Chrysler by the late 70s was already working on their minivan. As Lee Iacocca envisioned, they would be garageable, have a flat floor thanks to front wheel drive, a low step in height to get in and out of easier, have a car like ride and handling, and removable back seats for added practicality. Earlier on, it was to have conventional rear doors before switching to sliding ones like a van would have. They actually had the idea to make it a dual sliding doors, even th back then, but that was dropped to keep manufacturing costs lower. People associated full-size vans as only having a right-side sliding door anyway, and when you drop your kids off at school curbside, they wouldn't get out on the left facing traffic. Dual sliding doors then wasn't an alien concept though, as the Nissan Stanza wagon came out for 1982 with it. That in itself was a vehicle that blurs classification lines. Tall wagon, small minivan, or early crossover, as you could even get it with all-wheel drive. Anyway, the Chrysler small vans would not be K-car based as they technically had their own platform called an S. The vans would use many common parts from other Chrysler products, however, especially the K-cars, and arrived for the 1984 model year. Dodge had the Caravan and Plymouth the very similar Voyager. A base model had two rows of seating for up to five, but you can get an optional third row seat to increase people capacity to seven. The rear seats were all removable too in case you wanted to bring home an extremely heavy console television with a huge 25 inch screen. Those seats you could take out were not as heavy, but was a job best for two people to remove. They did not require tools to take out or install however, so no socket set was required. The vans with three row seating had second row seats that were shorter on the passenger side to allow easier access to the third row. You could also take the second row out and put it uh, put in the longer third row bench in its place, making the vehicle a five-seater again with greater cargo space. The low step-in height and flat floor made removing or adding cargo or people a snap. The single sliding door I chatted about earlier was standard. All in all, the interior was very practical. Dodge also offered a more stripped-down one-ton version without back seats with businesses in mind. The only oddity was the glove box. It was a slide-out thing located below the passenger front seat. Engine options for 84 for both vans was limited to two four-cylinder engines. Standard was a Chrysler 2.2 liter with 96 horsepower. The optional one was a Mitsubishi 2.6 liter with 106, but it had almost 25 pounds more torque. As it had a hemispheric combustion chamber, Dodge actually advertised these Japanese large four-cylinders as Hemi engines, and thanks to Mitsubishi's balance shaft design in their 2.6, 
it was a smoother option under the hood. The balance shaft design was actually so good, Porsche bought the rights to use it for some of their cars. Transmission options was a standard 5-speed manual or more common 3-speed automatic. Prices in 1984 started around $8,300 for a 1-ton work caravan, which is about $24,700 today. A SE model designed for families was a couple hundred bucks more. Or you'd get a top trim LE starting at $9,100 or around $27,000 now. Reviews at the time were positive. The meager horsepower numbers to lug around vehicles that started around 3,000 pounds were not applauded. But they handled well for what they were, had tons of practicality, and delivered much better fuel economy to a full-size van or wagon that these were created to take market share from. And that they did, as almost overnight, a station wagon was becoming more of a 1970s relic. If you wondered uh, what an early pioneer was in offering cup holders all over, it would be these vans. Most cars didn't start getting usable ones until the late 80s or early 90s. Those indentations meant to uh, place a cup on with the glove box door open do not count. I will say that a can of Coke did fit perfectly in the ashtray of my 74 Datsun 260Z I had though, and full-size conversion vans may have had them. Anyway, almost 210,000 caravans and voyagers sold in 1984. There was uh, competitors and some were even available the same year. Toyota offered a van here also for 1984. It was most similar in appearance to their home market Master A Surf version. Power was weak as it only had a 2 liter 4 cylinder with 87 horsepower. Toyota vans at launch were rear wheel drive only and not designed with our markets in mind. It wasn't cheap either as one in 84 started around 10,500 which is over 31 grand today. That was thousands more than a caravan then to start. Mitsubishi and Nissan had similar home market vans they imported over to in the 80s but none of these made a huge impact. GM, as I mentioned earlier, were thinking about a front-wheel drive minivan concept that would have beat the caravan to launch, but instead felt a rear-wheel drive model that used Chevy S10 and full-size wagon parts would be a better way to go. They could tow more and I'd argue made for uh, better commercial vehicles, but had a high step in height, didn't ride as well, got worse mileage, and were certainly more truck-like behind the wheel. The Chevy Astro and GMC Savari arrived for 1985, and although their sales couldn't touch the caravan, they stayed in the U.S. market over two generations until the 2005 model year. Chrysler minivan sales for 85 increased to about 243,000 sold. Ford joined the minivan race for the 86 model year with the Aerostar. It was closer to the Astro in terms of design and capability but also had many of the same drawbacks. Now, I know, I know, I've talked about quite a few minivans and they were not the Chrysler ones, but I felt compelled to point out that Chrysler vans in the 80s ruled the market and that trend continued through the 90s too. But let's get back to these vans and a few notable changes for the later model years. 85 offered a rare eight passenger option where the front seat was a bench allowing for three people up there. It must not have been popular because it's a one-year deal. 85 also offered a converted bed option if you got a five-passenger one. The rear bench seat back portion could recline back flat, creating a bed of sorts. This wasn't a super popular option either, but I think you could still get it in 86. 1987 would be a big year for these vans. For starters, the Caravan and Voyager got composite headlights and different grills now, as these previous ones like the Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon were basically clones with different badges. If you bought the Ram minivan work model, they still came with the old headlights. You could also now get extended length versions of either called a Grand Caravan or Voyager respectively. They were 14 inches longer and it seriously beefed up the cargo capacity. Like that wasn't enough changes, the Chrysler vans got a few more, and they are both new engines. 
The new Grand versions are standard with a 2.5 liter 4 cylinder. It only has 100 horsepower, but the torque is decent as it's not much less than the Mitsubishi 2.6 liter that was optional previously. The other engine option is something I'm sure caravan buyers were hoping for. A 3 liter V6 complements of Mitsubishi with 136 horsepower and 168 pounds of torque. The regular length vans have these same 2.2 or 2.6 liter 4s as before, but the V6 was also available too. V6 versions were also standard with an automatic transmission, and it proved to be a popular way to equip your van. The minivan buying masses appreciated all these changes and options, as almost 308,000 of them were sold. 1988 drops the original engine options, leaving the 2.5 liter 4 or optional V6 as your choices like what the grand versions had the previous year. The vans hit an all-time high for the first gen, with over 422,000 sold. For 1989, another engine option joins the mix. The 2.5 liter 4 is now available with a turbo. This engine had 150 horsepower and 180 pounds of torque, making it the most powerful caravan or voyager to date. You could even get one with a 5-speed, but most opted for the automatic. They also bumped the horsepower in the V6 versions to 142, up from the 136 before. Early in 89, another version of the Caravan becomes available as a 90 model. Chrysler now had a luxury version that they called a Town & Country. This name was last used for 1988 on a K-Car high trim wagon that Chrysler sold. The new town and country basically came one way, and that was loaded. You got the fake wood trim, alloy wheels, leather seats, power equipment, front and rear AC, and more. But you did pay for the privilege. The only color available was white at launch, but black was an option later in the model year. It was also standard with the 142 horsepower Mitsubishi Source V6, but a new Chrysler 3.3 liter one with 150 horsepower was phased in the same model year as the new standard power plant. 1990 Town & Country's MSRP was about 25,500, which is about 60 grand today. And that was literally twice the price of a standard caravan then, and a cargo version of one of those was about $1,000 cheaper. Surprisingly, not many bought Town & Country's, but Chrysler did find about 5,000 homes for them then, that, uh, that first long model year. Sales on all minivans by the beginning of the 90s was exploding as over 900,000 of them were being sold by then and Chrysler got the lion's share of it. For 1991, the Chrysler vans were all redesigned, making the previous town and country a one year only model with that body style. They all ride on a new AS platform that's similar to the previous one but revised. The styling is certainly evolutionary from before, too. Unfortunately, the 2.5 liter turbo is no more with these, but the other engine options basically carry over. Base and cargo regular length models have the 100 horsepower normally aspirated 2.5, 142 horsepower Mitsubishi 3, 3 liter V6, or the 3.3 liter 150 horsepower 6. I believe the 3.3 liter versions also had the 4 speed automatic and you could still get a manual on the four-cylinder. Grand Caravan, Voyager, and Town & Countries all had the 3.3 liter V6 and four-speed automatic. All-wheel drive was a new feature available, and you could even get it on the short wheelbase cargo version. That option was only paired with the 3.3 liter engine and was a pricey option because of it. A base cargo van, for example, started at 13,191, or 29,700 today. An all-wheel drive version of the same vehicle, as it would have had the automatic and big V6 too, jumps the price up to 16,600 or so. That's almost eight grand higher in 2024 money. The town and country version did not have all-wheel drive available its first year, but did get it available after. It did go down slightly in price from 1990, however, to about 24,000 from over 25,000 the year before. Still expensive though. Chrysler knew these vans were popular with families and dads and especially moms like safety. The 91 versions of all 
had an optional driver's airbag. Chrysler's minivans were basically cars to me, but they were classified as light trucks and as such were not required to have automatic seatbelts or an airbag then like a car would. 92 added a new option where the second row seats had built-in child booster seats and a driver's airbag was now standard on all of them. Town and country buyers who hated the wallpaper wood could delete it now, which I would have myself. 92 also brought back a manual transmission option on lower trim 2.5 liter four-cylinder versions. 94 would be this gen's refresh um, year and they were greeted to some notable changes. The dash was redesigned and they probably had good reason to do so as all the vans now had standard dual airbags. I believe Chrysler beat all the other minivans to the punch with this. They also had beefed up side impact protection in the doors designed to meet future 1998 standards. 94 also offered a larger 3.8 liter V6 as an option on the higher trim Grand Caravans and Voyagers, including the all-wheel drive ones. The town and country had the new 162 horsepower 3.8 liter standard, and by this time, the only major option on them was front or all-wheel drive. 95 models of all these vans largely carried over, as an all-new third gen would arrive for 96. By the 21st century, minivans accounted for a little over 7% of all vehicles sold in the U.S. annually. It was about half of that now in 2023. Now, I'm not Chrysler's biggest fan, but credit is due when it's deserved. The Chrysler minivans just got the formula right from the get-go and offered innovation and features over these first two generations. Sure, some stuff didn't stick, like the hide-a-bed or front three-row bench seat, but overall they had standard or optional features that buyers wanted. Looking back, it's amazing that it took other companies so long to offer minivans that were truly competitive, and some never would, even after several tries. I mean, yeah, if you needed to haul a boat, an Astro or Safari would come across as a better choice in the 80s, if you didn't mind a one-star crash test rating. Aerostars would be an option too, with slightly better crash worthiness than an Astro. GM's Dustbuster vans later was the first time anyone tried adopting the caravan formula more directly, but they went weird with the styling. The Japanese car makers initially just gave us vans that were probably considered regular ones overseas. By the early 90s, Nissan offered the Quest and Mercury had the similar Villager that were kind of like the caravans, but lacked the body length options and other unique features that the Chrysler vans had. Toyota was still going home market weird with an egg-shaped rear-wheel drive van that was mid-engine and it's just strange. Honda's first Odysseys uh, here were more like higher roof Accord wagons than minivans. And Mazda gave us the first gen MPV, which was a puzzling mix of SUV and minivan in some ways. Yeah, Chrysler definitely won big with their first two generations. But uh, will they hold that title later? Stay tuned as I will explore this with the second part of the Chrysler van soon. Anyway, this has been part one of my Chrysler minivan chatter, and I do hope you liked it. Please give a like and subscribe if so. And until next time, chatter out.